this stuff being really, really useful. So it is kind of a shame that um, I can only spend one lecture on this material because there is a lot to it. And I uh, just want this to be, I guess, my disclaimer that I won't be able to give you guys in-depth coverage of the topic as far as this client-side programming with JavaScript. Now, what is JavaScript? A couple quotes about it from famous people in the community, I guess. Uh, Douglas Crockford said, it's the world's most misunderstood programming language. Uh, I'm actually going to go to that and show you some of the reasons, because some of you, I don't know, may have heard different opinions about JavaScript. Uh, it was not a very popular choice back in the day, especially around the time that it came out, um, because, let's see, it's, it's developed a bad reputation for itself, especially with, uh, you know, the whole browser wars at the beginning, um, Internet Explorer versus Netscape, and you have I don't know, browsers competing at kind of an arms race against each other. And the early implementations of JavaScript themselves were buggy in browsers that were already buggy. So uh, server-side programmers usually looked at JavaScript and client-side programming with some disdain. And uh, I think we're to the point now that it's kind of just starting to wear off. So um, yeah, so if you have any like you know, pre preconceived notions about JavaScript, you may find, um, maybe during this lecture, that uh, they're not true. Uh, there are some quirks about it, as he says here, the language is perfect, but um, you know, it has come a long way since then, and it's one of the most widely adopted programming languages, uh, by far the, the largest on the web today. And it's the language of the browser. Uh, when you guys go through the slides after this lecture, it'd be good to check this link, uh, especially if you have you know, a genuine interest in this topic, because uh, the title of the article is The Best Way to Learn JavaScript. It goes through uh, a couple of step-by-steps for uh, longer-term assignments, I guess. And uh, that's just what you guys need, right? Another assignment. But uh, yeah, it, um, I looked over it before, before the lecture, and I have to say that I agree. Um, I can't cover all of it again. Can't cover all of it in one lecture. But if you wanna, if you wanna pursue it further, uh, that link would probably be a good one to follow. It's not a tutorial, but it's links to different tutorials, like um, uh, just different different coding sites that I guess have little uh, reward points when you when you go through the tutorials that are on there, and uh, you know a few different books that it'll recommend. Anyway. By definition, JavaScript is a prototype-based scripting language. It's dynamic and weakly typed, and a major feature of it is that it has first-class functions. Uh, what that means is functions uh, are just like any other variable in the language. You can assign them to other local variables. You can pass them as arguments, or pass them as parameters into methods. You can return a function <coughs> from a function. You can literally do anything you want with a function. And, uh, yeah, that, that makes that makes the possibility that uh, you know you can you can code in a few different paradigms. Basically, JavaScript is a very adaptable language that you can kind of mold to fit your style of programming. Um, if you do like functional programming, then you know you can code in it in that way, yeah, just plain object oriented, um, or just a, an imperative language. Like it's really up to you. But in my opinion, it gets really fun when uh, you kind of mix it up a little bit. Especially, you know, when the when the functional programming concepts kind of get into it, it, I don't know, it makes it pretty interesting. So, what is the point of learning JavaScript? Well, for one, it really is the heart of modern web apps. Um, can you guys think of what Facebook might be like without JavaScript? For example, if you were to click a I'll get into this, this concept later, but if you were to click the like link on just some content you're scrolling through your home feed, if you were to click the like link, basically you would have to submit the page to the server, the server would have to regenerate all of that content, send it back to the browser, and the entire page would reload on you um, just for clicking like on something. Uh, it, would, it would be just a major problem <coughs> both for the end user and for Facebook on their servers as well. Um, but the thing is, uh, even more importantly, it's an interactive desktop-like interface. So, with
with applications that obviously <coughs> you can only run that type of an interface if you were to install it on your computer. Um, like web forms, for example, <coughs> have some very basic UI where you can maybe tap between different fields, have radio buttons, check boxes, and you know that's pretty much it. But with this, you can develop really any kind of widget that you want, anything that you feel is user friendly. Um, you can really put a lot more effort user interface of your application so that um, I don't know, they're just a lot more convenient and fun to use. Um, so with JavaScript, the way that this is done is you can get programmatic access to the different browser objects that are built in. Um, also, all of your pages elements are accessible and you can control the style of those elements, you can get values from them, you can change the content on the page hide and show different things as they become relevant or relevant. Now, it's also, Dr. Chef touched on this one, it's an excellent option for creating a, cl a cross-platform application. And this goes beyond just running on Windows or Mac or Linux. Um, it's really anything that has a browser, and that includes, well, these days, mobile phones. And uh, it's all abstracted for you by virtue of the browser. You know, it's a built-in native language within the browser, and if there's a JavaScript-enabled web browser on whichever device you're trying to use, uh, that application, you automatically get support for that for free. So, basics of JavaScript. Um, I'm going to try to save some time. Of, see, I obviously can't teach you guys an entire language in one, in one lecture, but um, I'm hoping that all of you know either you know, the C syntax or, or Java like syntax, preferably both, because pretty much all of the things that these do have in common as far as the syntax of the language goes, uh, the basic ones. Uh, JavaScript borrows a lot of that too. And, um, you know, so you get the curly brace syntax for a code block. Um, it behaves slightly differently in that way, and I'll get to that. But uh, the control structures, your loops, your conditionals, and uh, a lot of your operators, those are the same as well. The logical ones are identical, and uh, most of the other operators that are in common between Java and C, um, those are also in JavaScript. So if you know those, one of those two languages, then you already have a huge head start on learning JavaScript. Um, the big difference is that JavaScript natively does not have support for classes. It's not built into the language. However, because it is such an adaptable language and because of uh, some of the concepts here that I will get to, I'll tell you what the bottom one says too. Uh, you, can, you, can, you can emulate the uh, classical inheritance structure of JavaScript as well. And um, you have information hiding, you, have, um, you can have inheritance, poly, not polymorphism, uh, but you get most of the object oriented principles um, from this language, even though it doesn't directly have support for classes at all. Um, clear variables with var, like a, <coughs> earlier it was um, dynamic and we would type this language, so you don't have to give a data type for any of these. Uh, you just declare var, your variable name, and then uh, whatever you're assigning to that variable. You have anonymous functions. This goes with uh, the functions as first class variables. They're like lambdas. Um, it's just First class. Now, scoping in JavaScript is one interesting thing about the language. Uh, so in Java and C, you have block scope. So if you declare something within a block of code and that block finishes, you don't have access to those same variables uh, outside of that block. In JavaScript it behaves differently because instead of the blocks being the delimiters on, on your scope, it's functions instead. <coughs> Something that goes with that that makes it very powerful is the concept of closure. That's what it says down there. Um, and what that means, is, has anyone heard of closure before? They can, I don't know, that's like a functional programming background. It, it means that since these functions, again, the first class variables, I'm going to keep going back to that and show examples of it later. If you, you can have a function declared inside of another function, and the concept of closure means that. Within the inner function, you have access to the variables of the outer function. 
So for as long as that inner function continues to deliver any reference that that inner function is created, the variables of the outer function that are referenced within the inner function are going to still be there. They're going to still be in scope, and they won't get garbage collected at that point. So in simple terms, it's just that variables within variables within an inner function have access to uh, references of the outer function. And uh, uh, when I go through some of the coding examples, I'll show you guys what kind of stuff you can do with that. Um, it's actually the backbone for how the classical, classical inheritance scheme and the information hiding within JavaScript. Um, it's how it's So, in the browser and with JavaScript, a lot of the interaction is done using the document object model API, or the DOM API for short. It uh, gives you access to all the elements on the page, all of your different tags that you've declared within your document. You can get access to those through this scripting language, JavaScript. And uh, there are a couple snippets on here that I'll, that I'll walk you guys through, kind of give you a feel for the API. Um, and declaring this variable, paragraph with var. And I'm just creating a new element out of a document create element. And p, that, that parameter, is the tag name. So I'm creating a p element there. So this shows with the programmatic access, you can assign an ID on the fly to this element. Just like your ID attribute in your HTML tag, you would just say p.id equals content. And then to that paragraph, and uh, how many of you guys use the W3C DOM parser in the, the XML project that you guys are working on? All right, that's good, because this is the same API. There are subtle differences, but um, I mean, you guys may have seen a pen child. That's more for, um, I guess, dynamically dynamically adding uh, child nodes to, to a, a node. But um, either way, it's the same API. You can do the same stuff in the W3C DOM Java API. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to append to the paragraph that I just created, I'm going to append a new text node. And that parameter is just the content of that text node. So I'm basically putting uh, some text within the, the, two, the opening and closing tag if you want to visualize it in actual XML syntax. So I'm just adding some text to this paragraph. And then I'm appending that paragraph to the body. Child is just going to put it at the, at the end of it. And uh, that's, that's an example of how you can uh, create new elements on the fly and manipulate literally any of the attributes with that. You can do any attribute. Uh, you can control the style of the element in HTML. Because remember, HTML is a subset of XML, just with special tag names. So this is an API. Just through like the dots in fact certain attributes have special special meanings in the DOM API, such as the ID. That's why, for example, just say p.id equals content and put it into the uh, put it into the DOM and it's the body and uh, it's there just like any other element. It'll actually show up on the page when you do that. So you can also manipulate the existing elements on the page. Um, this is an important method here. It's also on the uh, document object. I haven't talked about that much, and I probably won't, but um, most of, I'll, I'll say that most of the, uh, most of the interaction with elements on the page, or that will be appended to the body, or maybe those little, the uh, kind of global calls, you can think of them. Um, they are methods of the document object that's built into the browser. Um, so, get element by ID. Uh, that's going to get us a reference to the element of our choice. We're going to do the one that has the ID of content. So if I were to have run this code before running this one, this part would return the paragraph tag that we created up here with hello world inside. Um, and if I want to change the CSS properties of it, I'll say dot style, dot color, and I'll set it to blue, and that'll actually change the font color on the page. Um, there are also, and that's, that's an example of just setting the properties on this object. The browser picks up on those and it renders your changes. You also call methods here. Um, these are also in the W3C DOM and you guys might come <coughs> across them. Uh, maybe even just in the job doc when you were looking through. But um, some of the codes cut off on this. You guys can see it. We're just basically removing a child from the body and we have to pass a reference to 
to that child element that we want to remove. So we'll say again, document that body, that child notes, which is an array, and uh, the zero element, which is the first one. So that's just going to remove um, if this were to run in sequence. And there was nothing else on the page before this one. It would go down and remove that paragraph tag. So. back to this when I go through the coding examples because since I just went through the DOM API, I'm going to uh, mention some of the problems that it has. Uh, um, you guys probably noticed the code for it does not look all that out again, and if you have to just take the time to literally set every property in there, you're going to end up with a huge and uh, unmanageable mess of code that you want to really do you know, anything beyond the, the absolute basics of it. Um, the problem is that the API is just too low level. You can really, you can do whatever you want with it, but it's going to take a lot of code and uh, it makes it harder to read. It makes the challenge of organizing all of your code in the project all that much harder. And uh, another huge one is the cross browser compatibilities. Most of those think, do lie within the DOM API. They do vary slightly, but um, oddly enough, DOM API is standardized, but even with that being said, different browsers, different browsers will behave differently. When you call, say, um, like insert before method is another one, uh, they'll behave differently just based on the parameters, and you can run into huge problems that are really difficult to debug and abstract away. You're going to have to end up abstracting all of that if your goal is to make a cross-browser application, which it should be. Anytime you're making a, a web application in JavaScript, your goal should always be for it to have cross-browser compatibility, because if you don't, you're kind of robbing yourself of one of the main advantages of having a web application in the first place. Um, so I included a link to the reference here. It's again on W3C schools. Uh, you can go through it as needed. But um, again, it's, it's good to have an understanding of the DOM, but you don't really want to work directly with it unless you, unless you have to, which is at times you're trying to do like a special case that the uh, particular JavaScript API that you're using, the library doesn't have support for it. You may have to eventually go in and do that. But the better option is to use one of these libraries I mentioned. Um, practically a must for the production code is for cross-browser and if, say, you're creating an application that customers are paying for, <coughs> for a service, people can get pretty angry if uh, they're trying to use your site and you have a JavaScript error magically in your code, but if you did your testing in Firefox, it wasn't there, but uh, your user is using Internet Explorer, and, well, it's your job to find out why. And those cross-browser differences, especially with I don't know, the size that your code can get to if you're doing it in pure DOM, can be exhausting to try and find that bug and fix it and test it all over again in all the browsers just to make sure that it works. Um, benefit to using these is that you don't have to do any of that. Um, all of these have support for a wide range of browsers that are internet modern browsers and in some cases not even so modern. Uh, they have a lot of backward compatibility. Like I think jQuery goes back to Internet Explorer 6 and I don't know exactly how long ago that was but is going to come out soon, and uh, it, was, it was a while back. And, uh, you know, these are just some of the other ones. jQuery is, I think, by far the most common JavaScript library in use today. So that's the one that I'm going to teach you some of the basics of. Um, I have another disclaimer for you guys. In When it was said that uh, JavaScript is the most misunderstood programming languages, one of the reasons for it was that because of JavaScript's expressive power, you can, um, people who don't really know the language can, can still do a lot with it. Uh, they don't really understand what they're doing, but because of these libraries being really powerful, you can basically, you know, it's notorious for just copying snippets of code and putting them into your project. And a lot of times, you can get things to magically work. That, that's something that contributes to um, it being the most misunderstood language, and I have to admit that I'm probably going to contribute to that too by giving you guys such a quick lecture on, on this. So, 
really important to understand in JavaScript and DOM scripting is events. Um, you want your web applications and your, your UIs to be event driven um, so that a user clicks on something that's usually you know, a common starting point for some action that you want to take. You want to, you want to capture that event that happens. And uh, you do that with event listeners. Uh, jQuery makes it really easy. I won't show you guys an example of what it would take to make it cross-browser compatible um, in just the pure DOM API, but it's, it's kind of ugly. Uh, jQuery, this is a good example of um, what it does to simplify things. We're going to select something with the ID, my button, click on it. So we use the dot click method, and right here we're passing a function as the first parameter. It's an anonymous function. It's everything in blue there. It's an anonymous function that we're just creating right in place. Uh, doesn't have a name to it. We're just sending it as a listener. So when it happens, we're going to get the ID of content and set the HTML because we're passing something to it. Otherwise, if that were empty, it would just return the HTML that was in. So yeah, in the case. And other events that are just similar, you can replace this click with some of the other ones that you can expect from the browser, like a double click. You can sign a double click listener, but DBL click right there for hover, focus. Uh, hover works a little bit differently. You actually pass two separate functions to it. Uh, the first one executes, I believe, when the mouse goes over top of it, over the element, the target element. And the second function that you pass to it, you would literally put a column here and then define another another listener there. That would execute when the mouse leaves the page, or leaves the, uh, the target element. All right. So, have any of you guys heard of Ajax before? Um, it's a bit of a misnomer. Asynchronous JavaScript and XML. And the reason that I say it was named incorrectly was because you can return anything from the server with Ajax. Uh, it's not just XML. It can be really any interchange format that you want. Uh, it revolutionized the way the web apps work. Uh, for example, <coughs> something like, think of, I don't know, think of a really useful web application like Google Maps, for example. Uh, without a browser plugin, there is that caveat. Like, uh, without a browser plugin, there's no way that an application like that would be possible, just with all the interaction with it and the uh, this has to asynchronously load data. It has to communicate with the server without the page refreshing on you. Um, <coughs> Gmail, for example. You want to load your email, send the messages, but you don't want to submit a form every time and have your page reload on you every single time. And what Ajax allows you to do is to communicate with the server just by making these HTTP requests in the background, which was previously only possible by submitting the entire page. You can imagine when that happens, uh, the server has to generate the entire page full of markup instead of just responding with the raw data. You know, now with Ajax, it can just send like a really minimalized format of just the data that you need, and you can take that content and update via through DOM or through a JavaScript library. Uh, update the content on, on your page, uh, just that was sent from the server. So there's no page reload and. Um, When, it, when yeah, the browser would have to re-render everything when the form submits, and then also the programmer has to restore the state of the UI for that app. Like, say they're typing something into a form. It doesn't just happen automatically in all cases that when they submit that page, it reloads. The application's not necessarily going to look like it did when the user clicked to submit the form. So it takes special programmer effort to, to make sure that it's a nice user experience for them. Well, Ajax simplified a lot of that just because the page doesn't have to reload now and you can just get that data. So, this is, yeah. Oh, sorry. It's basically what Ajax does is, it basically allows you to transfer information in dynamic settings without actually bothering you reloading the page at all, more like a more direct communication. That's right, you can send parameters to the server, get parameters like Pavan mentioned in the last lecture. And uh, thanks, uh, you reminded me, I, I forgot to mention that he, um, he made reference to something I've been talking about. He was calling it the partial page updates without having, because he showed you guys forms last time 
sending those parameters to the server. The server runs its server-side code and uh, responds with the full page of content based on that. Well, this allows you to do these partial page updates that he was talking about just by sending parameters um, just kind of behind the scenes in the browser. It doesn't refresh, but there is an HTTP transaction going on behind the scenes where you get new data. And a really convenient way to get that data is in a format like this. It's called uh, JSON, JavaScript Object Notation. So it's an alternative to XML. It should be a breath of fresh air to you guys um, after the assignment that you're working on right now because, as you can tell, it's a lot more lightweight than XML. Uh, it's, it's another interchange format just like it, but we see that it's really just in what is called object literal notation in JavaScript, curly braces, and it's basically a map. A map of key value pairs every time that you see this. Uh, the keys, key is always in quotes, and this can be a number of different data types, um, but it's a string that needs to be in quotes as well. Uh, it was inspired by JavaScript's object literal syntax, but it's not exactly the same. There are some types that are native to JavaScript where you could do this kind of thing, like for example, putting, putting a function here. That's not valid in JSON as an interchange format. Um, and it doesn't quite make sense to do it that way anyway. But, uh, See that we have strings here. A key can be, or a value can be a string. It can be a um, number. It can be another object. So you can have nesting within these maps. Or it can be an array. It can be an array of any of any of the types I just mentioned. It can be an array of strings, an array of uh, numbers like this. Or it can be an array of other objects, which is what we have here. So. I don't know if you guys can tell from back there, but this is, these are the curly braces, and this is the uh, square bracket. The square bracket denotes that it's going to be an array. You don't have key value pairs within that array. You just have a flat list of whatever type that you're uh, putting into the array. So this is an array of other JSON objects. So we have two of them here. I actually uh, I combined the closing and the opening on this line because it is comma separated as elements of this array. I, yeah, I put them on the same line so I can make the font a little bit bigger for this slide. But a lot more lightweight than XML, it's easier to read. Um, and I think it's a lot easier to format on the computer <coughs> than an XML response is. Um, but the biggest advantage to it is on the front, I believe, because uh, when you get that data back, comes back and you and you directly have access to all of the properties of that object right from within the code. So there's no um, using the DOM API in there to, to get access to the element that you want. You don't have to say um, get element by ID and pick it out. You don't have to say get elements by tag name and go through it. <coughs> you literally have a plain JavaScript object when you get your, your response back and then you can just use the dot syntax on that object just like you would. <coughs> any other code in JavaScript and get access to the data that came back from the server. Questions? This, this is basically it's much easier than XML because we don't rely on schema or XSL. Or right. <coughs> we don't need any of that. Um, it's, not very, it's not a very common practice, but I guess people have and some, some do use a JSON schema, <coughs> but um, not a common practice. And uh, I don't know. It's, it's just a lot simpler than XML. So yeah, it should be a lot easier if you guys want to use that. So it's much simpler. Why is it that used more I mean, in place like XML at least? But. I think it is now. I think it is used a lot more often these days. It's starting to get that way. Um, Facebook uses a JSON for the graphics, yeah. But for all of it. Yeah, and then... Yeah, there are... Let's see. There are different APIs that allow you to choose which format you want back, but... From what I've seen, there's kind of a trend to where more and more of these are offering only only JSON because of just the prominence of client-side applications that want to that want to see this data. Um, there is a benefit to XML, I guess. So that the bloat that comes with XML actually can serve a purpose in some cases. It's with more, I guess, enterprise-type applications where you you want to be really strict about the data that comes back. Uh, you want to, I, I don't know, it's, 
you want to pass the validation, like if that's, that's just, uh, I guess if all of that's really important to you, then, well, you could use a JSON, JSON with, a, with a schema if you wanted to do it that way, but XML's been around for a lot longer. It's more, more established and, uh, yeah. So there are a couple different ways to respond from the server side with JSON. Again, the AJAX request uh, is the client, which is the browser, calling out to the server just with an HTTP request behind the scenes, and the server can respond with something like JSON. Uh, the way that it does that, on the official JSON website, there's the org.json package uh, for Java. You can use that right in your servlets. And uh, that's a link to the Java docs for it. I don't think there. I don't think that there's a, a compiled distribution of this right on that site. So it is open source of the, the whole package. You can build it yourself, or uh, the assignment that I'll give um, later on. It'll if you want to use uh, if you want to use servlets for it. I'll go ahead and send out like a jar. I'll I'll, I'll build it from the site and uh, make it easier on you guys. And then for PHP. Really simple, you call the uh, JSON encode function. I'm going to go to that to show you what it looks like. So, if you guys have never seen the, the PHP docs before, this is what they look like. It's, there are usually some good examples on it too, which is something nice about, about this documentation. Um, so, here's an example of how JSON encode is used. This could very well be the um, server-side script that's being called from, from uh, JavaScript with Ajax. Uh, it'd be perfectly valid. Uh, not that useful, but it's still valid. Uh, you have an array, it's key value pairs. This is called an associative array in PHP. Rather than just a list of a flat list of objects, you have key, oh, it's, a, it's a collection of key value pairs here. So A is one, B is two, and so on. But with that array, you just pass it to JSON encode, echo that, and you have a JSON response to the client side. And then the JavaScript. Um, I'll show you guys how to access, how to access it, and how, how convenient it is. The server can respond with JavaScript. So as we see here, it can also be it can also be a, the other type of array. Okay, so. 
episode, and I'll explain it step by step as I go along because there are a few different parts to this process, and uh, I'll walk I'll walk through that right here.
So to do the hello world, we can just have this one line, the alert, the alert function. I refresh the page. Pops up in you know, hello world there. Uh, the alert box isn't particularly pretty. You don't use it too often, I guess, in normal use, but uh, it's a good way to alert the user. So take note of that one, I guess. Um, now, let's let's do something with that uh, the div that's in the body of the page with the uh, ID called content. Try it with Puridon.
actually a method. It's like it's like this. This would be a valid this would be a valid call in JavaScript, but um, it's not going to do anything. What we want to do is pass into it an anonymous function as its only parameter, one that we've defined here. There to there with one line that actually uses this DOM element. I can't read it once. Document get element by ID with content dot enter HTML is hello. Uh, what it's going to do? We won't get an error when we save and run this because jQuery is going to wait to execute this function that we're passing in until the, the the browser has gone through and rendered the entire page. So that element becomes available. And then this code runs, and now it should work. <coughs> there it is. So, are there, are there still questions about, about how that works or, or what it does? Could this be over the JavaScript to run properly and have the, not the Ajax, but the yes. <coughs> jQuery will probably need to be able to access everything you read in the original uh, file and match up to like content is what we're using for part. I want to go through here, here's my referencing. Yeah. Um, basically the only purpose of that dollar sign and passing a function into it uh, was waiting for the page to load. Uh, that's that's the only that's the only purpose that, that it was serving in that case. So I went through the whole page. Basically, jQuery is going to defer execution of the function that you're passing in until the page is fully loaded and the DOM is ready to be manipulated. Yes. Question. Is there any particular reason they use the dollar sign instead of something a little bit more intelligible to humans, like yeah. run this when the page is done loading? Well, um, so it's just it's just shorthand. Uh, for jQuery. Mm -hmm. If you can replace the dollar sign with the word jQuery. You can, yeah. It'll work. But, no, what that means though when you're passing a function into it, it's used here, is there's an alternative. That, that's a good point. Um, we can do document. Because I mentioned the, the document object earlier, that's just part of plain DOM. Uh, if you guys remember, I was doing document.body.appendChild, and that was before I mentioned jQuery at all. That'll work browser. Uh, basically, in this case, we pass the document to the jQuery function and then call, just like these, the click listener example that I showed you, mm -hmm. ready is an event. When the document is ready, we're passing this function. Like that. So when the document's ready, that's when this is going to load. Uh, so just for people to be lazy? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and because it's so common, you need it in almost every application that was done that way. I should have showed you guys this way first, and then I can replace it by cutting out this part and basically passing this function right into there. So I apologize. To you guys, that's probably very confusing. Um, yeah. But no, the that's not the only use of the dollar sign function. It's used um, in pretty much every jQuery call that you make. It's going to start with dollar sign, but it behaves differently depending on what's passed in as the first parameter. If it's a function, it's going to execute it when the document's ready. If it's a string, it's going to interpret it as a CSS selector to get you a collection of objects. Um, or in this case, it's actually a DOM node. It's a reference to a DOM node, the document object. So it's basically converting that into a jQuery object <coughs> that we can that has this uh, ready method defined. So again, this is an event listener, kind of like the click. Um, and when the document's ready, run the function that I'm passing it for. Okay. Um, I want to show you guys an example of a class in JavaScript. And the way that that's done, it'll, it'll demonstrate the concept of, a, of closure and just how methods are defined. Okay. So 
really simple class here. Just call it hello. Um, again, since the functions are first class variables, this is just how you define a local variable. It's in the global namespace since it's not wrapped in anything. Basically, if you just start writing code, uh, it's not within a function. It's going to be in the global namespace. That it's, it's essentially a global variable. And then it's class. It's a yeah, and that's a, that's fine for your classes to be that way. Uh, so we're saying our variable hello is going to be a function. It takes a name parameter, and within that function, which let me say this part first, it's going to so this whole function here is uh, it serves as the constructor for our class. So it's a little different than what you guys are used to, rather than having like a class block and having the name of the class being the constructor. Since JavaScript doesn't have built-in support for classes, this is how it's done. Um, the whole thing, the whole function here, from top to bottom, is the constructor of the class. And uh, this is going to eventually be a private variable. It's a variable that's local to the constructor function. And um, we'll, see what, we'll see what we can do with this, or how we get access to it. The reason I have it as a local variable to the constructor is just for the information hiding. It's it's a private variable, and, and this is how you do it. It's also worth noting that this this parameter here is also um, by virtue of this method call. It's also going to be a, uh, a private variable of the class. Just whatever's passed into the constructor, and um, because it's referred to here within another method. Um, by, and it, this demonstrates the concept of closure again. We have an inner function here. Uh, let me backtrack. We're, de we're declaring a method here on our on our hello class called say. So we would call this by instantiating hello. And you do that with new hello. I'll, I'll do that when I actually run this code. But then I can say my hello dot say. And it's going to basically alert to you hello, whatever name you passed in. And then this also demonstrates the uh, ternary operator. If it's enthusiastic hello, then it's going to have an exclamation point, otherwise empty string with nothing. Um, demonstrates the concept of closure, because this is an inner function here. And it refers to a variable that was declared in an outer function. So even though it's a parameter to the constructor with its reference here, then that variable is going to continue to live, not go out of scope, because this method is still going to be to know what that was at the time that it's run. Uh, we have we have a setter here for the name, so we can change it. And what we do is just assign. Uh, we don't want it to say var name. We want to refer to the actual private variable that was passed in there. And uh, we set it to whatever's passed it into our setter. Same with enthusiastic. Uh, <coughs> I included the uh, double exclamation point there to remind me to talk about JavaScript's type coercion that it has. Um, basically, anything, any object or any reference in the language can be interpreted as a Boolean value. It's either true or a uh, what they call falsy value. Like um, zero will go to false, the empty string will go to false. Um, and there, there, there's a list of other ones. But the reason that I do the double exclamation point, it's like basically I'm doing a double negative of it. I nod, I nod it, it's just in case somebody passes in something that is not explicitly false there. It's going to, it's going to nod it. Let's say they pass in a string, a string called hi. Um, since I guess we're going to interpret that as a, uh, as true in this case, but anyway, we turn it into, since the string true would evaluate to true in language JavaScript, we will knock that once to make it false, not it over time to make it true again. So we basically, yeah, of course, we, we, uh, we wanted it to explicitly be a boolean. Um, so we'll just do the double knot. It's not something you commonly do, but again, I wanted it I wanted to use it as a reminder, so I would tell you guys about the type of coercion. Um, just in the same way, you can have a string and use the 
plus as a concatenation concaten operator, and uh, you can have a string plus a number, and it'll just it'll just handle it and append that number if necessary. Question. Um, so if you pass um, the empty string as the value of e, and do the double negation, that would set it to false and then true. Right. Okay. Right. Yeah, because the first the first uh, exclamation point would turn that double name, that uh, it would turn that empty string into true, because it generally evaluates to false anyway. It turns it into true and it turns it into explicitly false. All right, so this is our, this is our class we have. We just have these three methods. Let's go ahead and make an instance of that class. Let's get a It's more than, that's a good question. It's more of, I guess, being, being I guess, kind of strict in your code because in JavaScript there's actually the triple equals operator, and then there's also exclamation point equal equal. In that one, it, it's not a, it's not a, it doesn't do type coercion when it evaluates. So if you're expecting, uh, if you're expecting something to be explicitly true or false, just so that, like, say you're li writing a library and it actually depends on it, um, then uh, that's when you're going to want to use the triple equals to evaluate. I'll, I'll actually show an example of that. Now, in this case, it's not it's not going to matter at all, just because this is our condition to the ternary operator here, and it's just gonna, it's just gonna interpret it the same way that it's done just right here with this on its own before doing the, the double negation. But uh, if I were to do this, <coughs> if I do double equals true, then yeah, this would still be pointless because it would still do the type of coercion. But if I change that to a triple equals true, then it would actually do like a strict check of the type. Like it wouldn't change the type to fit the uh, to fit the conditional. And and yeah, but uh, do do you want me to show an example of that? Like if I just like pass it, passing in different things. It's it's kind of a minor detail of the language. I don't. I don't want to get too caught up on it. Five minutes left, but um, yeah, I can, I can post a link or something if you're curious about it. Yeah. Okay. Is that like some sort of sanitation of the data, or what you're passing on? Yeah, there are there are certain instances in there where you want to make sure that it is explicitly true or false, where the type does actually. One example, I got it. I don't know. I don't want to confuse everyone. But one example is if you're, let's say you're implementing your own like for each method, which would take um, a list. It would take an array and it would take a function that would be executed for each value in kind of a functional programming style. The way a lot of libraries do it is they check the return type of of the function that you're passing in, the one that's going to be called for every element. If you return false from that. And it stops the execution right then. It's a way to break the loop when it's iterating through it. Um, 
Now, if you were to just check the return value and say like if not, and then call that function, then since functions by default return undefined, if it doesn't, if, see these don't return anything at all. So these, these setters actually return a special variable in JavaScript called undefined. If it were to check that type, even though it's not returning false from that function, it would still break the loop just because undefined evaluates to false if you use the uh, only the double equals if, you, if it does the type correction. Like there, there, there are cases that that happens. Um, I think it's more when you're writing libraries, for example, when you actually have to be really strict about the type. Um, I probably shouldn't have even included the, the double double ex exclamation mark because it kind of uh, takes away from what I'm going to show, <coughs> which is that it is dynamic, but there are cases where you have to be careful. Like you run into bugs, and um, <coughs> some, of the, some of the design choices of the language itself, you'll, you'll find that it's a little bit broken. Because of the way that it's uh, <coughs> into the, in, in the conditions, especially. Alright, um, so let me, let me try to go some, through something real quick. I will same file. Oh, I also didn't mention why I broke this up into two different files. Uh, typically it's, it's, good, it's good by convention to have your class name start with an uppercase. It'll remind you to call new on that object. Uh, bad things can happen if you try to call the constructor without the new keyword. So if that accidentally happens, we'll kind of plop in the global namespace. I won't get too far into it. But anyway, we put this class in its own file with the matching file. You can it, but it's just it's good for code organization. Um, okay, so we have our button there, and a separate file, the one we're doing here. This is where we're doing our like uh, our, our code that we want to run at the time the browser is loaded or the page is loaded. Uh, actually, just don't want to read this. All right. So with jQuery, it's again our dollar sign function and the CSS selector to get that button. Just copy ID BTN click. We're going to pass a function to it, which is going to be our click listener. When that happens, we're going to do the, uh, the get JSON, the get JSON function. And let's see, put that on out. 
JSON data just from a file on the computer. Normally, we call a script that would return JSON for it to be useful to use Ajax, but um, in this case, I'm just going to put the JSON straight in a file, and then I'm going to call for that, and uh, just to show you guys how it's used. The parameters to get JSON are, for one, the URL, and if the second one is a function, it's a callback for when you're Remember I said the uh, Ajax request, it actually makes a call in the background. We're about out of time. Um, it, makes a, it makes a call in the background, and this is basically your listener, uh, because it runs asynchronously. Basically it makes the request, and your code will just keep jumping through it. And anything you put after this will run immediately, even before the response comes back. That's why the code is much run when the data comes back in. It's the VMS callback function. And I'm just going to log the data that comes back in. I'll show you what that does. I'll say that if you if and if you need to leave, feel free to. I'm gonna I'm gonna get send you guys out some resources. I'll make a good example for you, put a lot of comments into it, and uh, I'll make sure it's in a way that you guys can understand. If, if it's unclear, email me as much time as you can get it. Yeah. Um it's not ready yet. Okay, so it's, gonna, okay. it's gonna depend on the stuff that I'm gonna send with this. Did you have something to say about it? Um. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There's no one do that. Yeah, no one do that. But about this stuff, 